Hello, and welcome back to Inherited Will, a One Piece podcast. My name is Thomas, and this is my co-host, Jordan. Say hello once again. Hi, everyone. <laughs> to briefly recap what this show is about, we are a weekly One Piece podcast discussing the current uh, anime and manga chapter. Uh, we also will discuss that week's news, any rumors, uh, that kind of thing that might have come out since the previous episode. And then after that, I've been calling it the Variety Hour. In this particular case, we'll be discussing the events of manga chapters 1 through 15 from a current manga reader's perspective. In this particular case, the manga is on break this week, so we'll be jumping straight into the anime discussion. Anything you want to say before we begin? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll start us off. This is something that I've discussed with you in the past, and I felt the need to sort of reiterate, sort of change my tune. In the past, I have been pretty against openings in anime because they so often will spoil things for people that might not be current with the manga, which is, I don't know, because to a certain degree they might expect people to be caught up, but I think that doesn't make sense. You have to account for your lowest denominator. But this opening, I feel, is actually pretty good. I felt like uh, it doesn't actually give that much away, and I was very impressed. It does give away a little bit, but certainly compared to how some of the older openings were, for sure, not as bad comparatively. I mean, they've spoiled that Robin was going to be joining the crew like halfway through the Alabasta arc. On that note, I do want to point out that while Jordan and I are both caught up on the manga, we are going to try our best to approach the anime discussion from an anime-only watcher's perspective, meaning we're going to try very hard not to discuss any spoilers for the manga. In this particular instance, we kind of lucked out in that the events of this episode haven't really been expanded upon in the manga yet, so we're free to speculate without having to worry about spoilers by and large. But for future episodes going forward, that won't be the case. So we're going to be trying very hard not to spoil anything. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in. This is the first episode in the second Wano intermission before the ending of the events of Act 3. We're returning to the events of uh, The Reverie. The first thing I had down here was a uh, Garp and King Neptune's discussion about a report he received as they were leaving Reverie about an incident that occurred regarding Alabasta. This isn't touched again at all in the entire episode. Do you have any thoughts about what could have happened in regards to Alabasta? Maybe the king and Vivi are not in a great situation. Maybe it's maybe it's the duck whose name I forget. <laughs> you think poor Karu might have been targeted? Could be. You gotta start with the most powerful, right? Fair enough. Now it could also just be that Garp is just talking about the warlord thing, because it was Cobra and King Riku. They were kind of like at the figureheads of that discussion. Um, but I think if that were the case, then he would have also mentioned Kane Riku when he was talking to Neptune. But who knows, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll find out at some point. Now from there, we pop over to uh, your boy Big News Morgans, who implies pretty heavily, and the rest of the episode does this as well, that uh, Sabo is dead. Something happened to him post-Reverie when they made their move, and he ended up dead. Do we think Sabo's really dead? If I understood correctly, this is the information that the world government was actually trying to pay to cover up? That was what I understood as well. Why would they want to cover that up? That would be probably a pretty big win for the world government to take out one of the, I believe, commanders of the Revolutionary Army? I agree, but I think the point of covering it up would be to cover up the fact that the Revolutionary Army staged an attack on uh, Mary Joa in the first place. I don't think they want it out there that they made it that far into their, their main turf, you know? I, yeah, I suppose so. Made them look bad if, uh, like, five guys, I guess in this case, I think it was more like three or four, actually got and attacked on their home turf. But the only way that they actually look bad is if they do poorly. And if they took out Sabo, who has made quite a name for himself, 
I think that would make them look good. At the cost of previously making them look bad for letting them get that far in the first place. Yeah. I think it's kind of a, a win-lose situation for the world government if that information gets out. I guess that's fair. Do I think Sabo is dead? No. <laughs> you don't think they killed Sabo off off screen? They certainly could make that move, but I would be pretty surprised. Oda's been off screening a lot in uh, Wano up to this point, so it wouldn't surprise me terribly. This could be the world government playing, you know, 3D chess and convincing Morgan uh, with a bribe that they want it covered up, but actually maybe Sabo isn't dead. Just trying to think about all different all different paths here. You know, that's a good point, because we've been speculating for a couple minutes now that no, Sabo's not actually dead. But why would the world government be trying to cover up their involvement if something hadn't actually happened with them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very strange. Now, a couple moments after this, uh, after the incident with the government agent that infiltrated Morgan's ranks, uh, he gets a call from Wapple, who has leaked intel for him in some capacity. So that's a little strange, considering it doesn't seem like the other world leaders we see during this episode, they didn't even seem to know about the Sabu incident because it happened after they had all left. So what kind of information could Wapple possibly have that Morgans would want? I don't trust Wapple as far as I could throw him, and he's he looks pretty unthrowable to me. Yeah, he's a large man. Yeah, so uh, I think he's, again, possibly just stirring the pot. I'm trying to think of where we last saw Wapple, but like other than the reverie, I don't think he's been around. Maybe on the front page inserts for some of the chapters. He did have an own cover arc, but it really only covered the events from after he got booted off of Drum Island to how he created his own toy empire. And that's how he ended up invited back to the world government. Right. Aside from explaining how he got from point A to point B, nothing of particular note happened to that cover arc. But here's something I was thinking about that he might have been uh, wanting to leak to the presses. Is that Wapple knows about certain heads of kingdoms connections to the straw hats for example he knows that dalton has a link to the straw hats and he might have known after they kind of like all were palling around together at the reverie that vivi and the king of alabasta have a connection to the straw hats so he might be just kind of leaking that information out of spike to make that uh those countries look bad that certainly could be that would be that would be interesting classic wapole am i right what a guy yeah definitely a Fan favorite. Indeed. Then uh, then we cut to Dragon and company on the Kamabaka Kingdom. And they can't seem to contact uh, Sabo or any of the other guys that went with him to Mary Jawa to confirm whether or not he's dead in the first place. So that kind of lends credence to that something happened to them at the very least. Whether or not Sabo was dead is certainly not confirmed here. But uh, something must have happened to him at the very least. Wouldn't, well, uh, this this is speculation as far as I know, but wouldn't it make sense for them to have, like, uh, a Vibra card for Sabo? And if someone dies, doesn't it, doesn't it, like, burn up? Uh, yes, that would make sense for them to have one of those. Uh... So... <laughs> I think they would know whether he was dead or not. Well, they don't bring it up at all, but you would think, yeah, they would totally should have Viva cards for Sabo and all the other commanders so that they'd know with 100% certainty <laughs> whether or not their main guys are in trouble. I would certainly do it that way. Even even if I was in Underground Revolution, I would, yeah, I would want to know. And, like, you know that Sabo knows how to make them. He made one for Luffy on Dressrosa. Yep. Hmm. I think we might have found a small flaw in your story here, Oda. But uh, he'll he'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> he'll loop it back somehow. He always does. Then we cut to a very brief scene about Blackbeard. About he is going to beat the government to something. 
He doesn't want the government to have it. He's going to get it instead. Uh, what on earth is he talking about? I expect a definitive answer from you right now. Okay, so, yeah, thanks. Great. <laughs> Blackbeard, what he's really after seems to be power more than anything. Based off of his abilities, we know he has the the, the skills, the, the abilities to take other people's double fruit powers. And people need to be alive for that to happen, I'm fairly sure. Because once someone who has the fruit power dies, I think the fruit comes back, correct? We've only seen an example of this one time, but yes, that does appear to be the case. Now, in the case of Whitebeard, it was stated that he was dead before he threw the the black cloak or cape or blanket, whatever that was, over top of him. But he might have just been on the verge of death. I don't know, but that is what was said at the time. Maybe there's like a, a minute and a half long like waiting period before the fruit actually zoops into something else. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess there's something. But regardless, the world government is making moves on the previous warlords. Uh, and if they were to either capture or kill them, then their devil fruit powers, if he was interested in any of them, would be lost to him. I suppose that's true, but consider the following. Out of the four uh, existing warlords of the time, only two of them are confirmed to have devil fruits. We don't know about Weevil, but it hasn't been said one way or the other so far. One of the others is Buggy, whose fruit isn't especially useful as like on the same level, at least, of like the other two he has. And then the other one is Handcuffs, which requires sexual desire in order for it to be useful. Which, not to be mean the Blackbeard, wouldn't help him very much. <laughs> now it could just be that, okay, the government's making big moves. They're kind of weakening themselves by going after the warlords right now. So maybe Blackbeard decided to go ahead and make his move on the other uh, road Pondoglyphs. Maybe he's like, all right, this is our chance to go after the One Piece while the world government is distracted or something like that, you know? Certainly could be, yeah. We know that he needs those just like everyone else does. If that's even his goal. I mean, I don't think it's even been explicitly stated that uh, Blackbeard wants the One Piece. I think he does, and it may even have been stated before that he does, but I don't think I don't think it's been explicitly stated. I don't remember any instances. Blackbeard's ultimate goal beyond Marineford, I don't think, has gone been gone into in any detail so far. Then, shortly after this little bit with Blackbeard, which only lasts about thirty seconds, we find out a sweet little tidbit about X Drake. We had already known in the past that Drake was originally a government man. He seemed to go rogue and became a pirate after that. Turns out he's still a government man. He's the captain of a secret government agency called S.W.O.R.D. And the only other confirmed member, as of now, is Kobe. What's up with that? Who the heck knows? This is, this is the first time that we've heard about this. Uh, Drake is... I mean, he's all over the place right now. He's working for Kaido. He's part of the world government. He's his own pirate. <laughs> Who can tell? Kobe, on the other hand, Kobe started his whole thing with a showing of corrupt government, and he was very against that. So I want to think that what they're doing is... I don't know what I want to think. I don't trust them either. I don't like them. <laughs> You don't trust this whole sword operation? I mean, I don't like any of the world government, really. Garp's on thin ice. <laughs> I see. Now, presumably, since... I mean, we don't know this for sure. But presumably, Drake has been in cahoots with the world government since his introduction. So it kind of seems as though him joining Kaido's crew in the first place was probably just to keep tabs in Wano, I would assume. We don't know that for sure, but... That's my assumption, at least, right? Yeah, to be a spy on the inside. And now, because of him, the world government... Now, we don't know like how common knowledge the information that S.W.O.R.D. uncovers is going to be to, like, the top brass of the Marines. Like, for example, 
we don't know if like a kainu is the one who like commands sword beyond drake it could that be he reports directly to uh the gorose or something um but someone in the world government is pretty soon going to know that big mom and kaido are in cahoots so they may decide to send troops to wano to uh do something about that whole mess that is brewing there that would be interesting to see i don't I, I can't imagine who they would send to deal with threats that big, especially when they know that the supernovas are there as well. I can't think of anyone that they would send other than the admirals, honestly. No one else seems up to snuff. Yeah, they would have to send a, at least a couple of them. <laughs> I don't think even just one is going to be enough to take on Big Mom and Kaido and all the other pirates that are there at the same time. Especially when they're using all this manpower to capture the, the warlords. Yeah, good point. Very strange. Don't know if the world government is going to be involved in Wano proper at all. They seem to kind of have their hands full as is. But they do at least know about it now. For it's now revealed through these two discussions when Drake brings up that uh, CP0 is now uh, in Wano as of right now. That reveals that it's not common marine knowledge that the world government has dealings with Orochi, which I think is fascinating. Even, like, fairly high-ranking dudes like Drake and uh, Kobe don't know that. Uh, yeah, agree. Wano has supposedly been separate for so long, but... Yeah, turns out that's not so much the case. And Orochi's uh, dealings seem to have been escalating as of late. Now he wants Vegapunk, so I don't think that uh, they're going to give him Vegapunk, but that's what he wants. Orochi tends to... Tends to want a little bit too much. Classic he. Now we find out that the warlord system has indeed been abolished and they're wanted criminals again. That's especially bad for Hancock in particular, if you think about it. Well, yeah, we were we were shown pretty much immediately the, the, the panic that goes on there. Indeed. Now, I thought it was strange that, like, I think this mostly happened at the beginning. Uh, but when they were showing like the people's reactions to uh, the warlord system being abolished, that some people were like so upset <laughs> about this news that they were sobbing. Why would people be so distressed that the warlord system is being abolished when they mostly just kind of show up, kill pirates as they please, and then leave? You know. Well, I was wondering about that too because I think. The part that you're specifically referring to is the scene in, I believe, Alabasta, where, like, it's showing this child running through the streets with the papers falling down, and then there's a commotion, and they're sobbing. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> well, I, I gave it some thought, and, you know, earlier, Big News Morgans said that, like, there was too much news going on to just have one front page. So there would be two front pages. So that alone could factor in. But there, there could be any number of news articles in there that they read and were upset about, I suppose. I guess that's true. But the way the episode was structured, talking about mostly these two things, the, the, uh, the revolutionary attack and the world government being abolished, it kind of sets us up to think that those are the things that these people are reacting to. But I suppose you're right. They didn't outright say that uh, that is what these people were reacting to. So, Yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me why anyone would be upset about that. The only two examples we have are awful. It's true. Now, it could be that, like, I'm just speculating. We don't know this be the case. But maybe this is an island that is pretty frequently attacked by rogue pirates. And it also happens to be pretty close to where Mihawk likes to hang out or something. So just by coincidence, he often happens to, quote-unquote, help them by killing random pirates. But I feel like that should have been touched on a little bit more if that were the case. Agreed. But yes, this does seem to be especially bad between the four of them for Hancock because her entire country <laughs> kind of relies on her status as a warlord to exist. It certainly does, but I've got a feeling that they will end up adapting quite well. They, they have shown that 
they can be a force to be reckoned with, and they'll they'll probably be able to hold their own. They're also in the middle of the uh, the calm belt, correct? Uh, yes, Amazon Lily is in the calm belt. Yeah, so they're they're in a place that is difficult enough to reach as it is. So they only have the world government to deal with, and specifically, it's Kobe who's showing up, uh, who has a relationship with Luffy, and so does Boa. So something uh, with that could certainly play in here. I agree, but that only works out if we assume that Kobe is like the highest ranking officer and the one in charge of the fleet going after Hancock, which we don't know for sure if that's the case. No, we don't, but we don't really know much around this situation, so... That's true. I thought it was very strange, just in general, like the visible tiers of people that they're sending after these guys. There weren't any notable Marines that we saw being sent out through these people, except for Kobe, for Hancock, and uh, Vice Admiral Stainless. He was the guy with the mustache that we saw going after Buggy. Those were the only two like named Marines that we saw going after these four, well, three plus buggy very powerful people which i thought was very very odd yeah i mean where's where's smoker at this point you know what's what's he doing that has him so tied up he can't take on one of them last we saw smoker he was delivering those kids um that were on punk hazard being experimented on by caesar and i think we saw a scene of him like discussing the warlord system with uh fujitora but Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, I can't imagine he's terribly busy at the moment. It's been like a few months since he was fucked up by Virgo and uh, Doflamingo. So I can't imagine he's like still super injured after that. I would agree. He should be good to go. Maybe we'll see him soon. Who knows? My guess is that Weevil and Mihawk are like the biggest threats out of those four. And we didn't see any Marines in particular going after them. I think it would be a real bad call on the Marines part to not at least send several vice admirals or an actual admiral after Mihawk at least. Yeah, they have to know what they're dealing with. They've worked with them for a number of years now. And Mihawk has a reputation for being the world's strongest swordsman. So like RIP to the scrub Marines that they sent after him. Yeah, they, there's no way they're going back. Indeed. Do you have any other specific points you wanted to discuss about the this episode? Uh, Kobe needs to put on a shirt. <laughs> I agree. I did think it was strange that he was just wearing that little coat that entire time. But, you know, he looks good. I can't blame him. He wants to show off a little bit. Other than that, uh, I thought the scene that kind of showed all the warlords past and present where they just kind of intercut them was very well done it was nice little refresher and just nice to see them all again i guess yeah when i was watching it the first time it kind of bothered me that they were like recapping this information that most dedicated one piece fans are going to know but i was re-watching it for the purpose of my notepad here it was only like two minutes long so it really didn't bother me that much they, they leaned a little bit more into it than they probably needed to, but I thought it was at least done well, so I was okay with it. Yeah, it looked great, no doubt. Just recaps tend to bother me just in general. Yeah, that's usually a pain. But I thought overall the episode looked really great, despite the kind of leaned on still shots pretty frequently, but even those were very well composed. The two-minute recap that I mentioned... Again, it bothered me the first time through, but it really wasn't a big deal at all. And it was an episode just filled to the brim with big news. Yeah, maybe someday we'll get some new uh, new stingers for the halfway point. But For the love of God, I want, <laughs> I want them to include the rest of the crew in the eye catches. Why has it only been Zoro and Luffy? I don't know how long Wano has been going on episode-wise, but... Too long for them to only have those two. Yeah, it it is baffling. I don't know a lot about the animation process, but it's like a 10 second long clip, like from start to finish. So I think they can probably uh, 
whip something up without it taking up too much of their schedule, you know? Yeah. Now, here's a, a fun nugget, Jordan. Did you know that as of last week's episode, well, not last week's, but the previous episode, uh, that the episode, that the anime has passed the manga in terms of like the episode to chapter ratio? Oh, that's, that's actually really interesting. No, I didn't know that. Let's take this week's episode, for example. This took place in the manga in chapter 956, and this is anime episode 957. So we now have more anime episodes than manga in terms of, like, up-to-date content, which is kind of embarrassing for the anime. Yeah, it's not exactly a good sign, but it's not like they can fix it at this point. Pretty much. One Piece has had its anime pacing issues for a long time now, and I don't think they intend to do anything about it at this point. Especially since they're so close to the uh, current manga at this point that they can't really do anything about it without filler arcs, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody wants a Naruto situation where they have filler arcs in the middle of an existing arc. That wouldn't go over well. No, I'm amazed that filler is still a thing in this day and age. I mean, I guess so. I mean, with anime like uh, Demon Slayer, for example, and My Hero being seasonal, they can generally avoid having to do it with uh, that kind of format. But with Toei being pretty dedicated to the uh, every week when possible uh, format, I don't, I don't think there's any avoiding it from time to time. Well, that's that's the part that's surprising to me, though. Like other other things. Uh, outside of anime like other other media has proven that people are willing to wait for things like they are just they're willing to uh and and i personally i don't know anyone who has ever said i really enjoyed that filler so it's just it's it's shocking to me personally i don't really understand the logic behind it but i've seen claims that they stand to make more money putting out consistent weekly content to keep like one piece in people's minds, I guess. But, you know, with the monitor going on, you would think that wouldn't really be an issue. But that's the claim I've seen. Well, that's still a shame, in my opinion. Shouldn't be done for that reason, but whatever. I'm not in charge, so what do I know? Maybe one day you will be. Now, is there anything else you would like to say about the NMA before we move on to the news segment? Nope. <laughs> Great. Moving on to the news. We've got a couple of things to talk about today. Not quite as much in detail as we did last week, but I did want to bring up, first of all, that for the dub fans out there, um, this actually happened slightly before last week's episode, but I just did want to bring attention to it, that new dub episodes have been released. Episodes 642 through 656 are now available through Funimation on Microsoft Movies and Sony PlayStation Network. Only available for purchase as of now, with intent to put them on Blu-ray once they have enough episodes to put on disc. That's good to hear. Indeed. The One Piece dub was on a break for like five years, I think. They didn't put any new episodes up until uh, this past year where they started really speeding it up. I don't personally follow the dub, but a lot of people were making calls for that to happen, so I'm happy for them. Now. I think you heard about this in brief, Jordan. I don't know how in detail you looked into it. And this news isn't specific to One Piece, per se, but to many Shueisha properties. You heard about this uh, crackdown that's been happening on, like, Twitter GIFs and other such drawn content on Twitter and other uh, social media recently? I have. I mean, I've, I've heard whispers. Uh, I tend to stay away from a lot of social media. And frankly, I've been staying off the internet lately more than uh, in previous weeks. But I did hear that they were, they were starting to take some action on people. Indeed. We've been getting reports this past week that Shueisha, the parent company of Shonen Jump, they basically own Dragon Ball, One Piece, and all sorts of other... Uh, anime and manga properties. They've been cracking down on a lot of content that people have been posting. We've been getting reports that uh, Twitter gifts have been flagged, and thus when you get like a, so many strikes on Twitter, they lock your account for a certain number of days until you remove that stuff. Uh, but it hasn't just been like 
things they directly own. It's also been things like fan art, uh, cosplay pictures, things that you wouldn't really think <laughs> they would have legal right to strike. People have been speculating that it's due to a new copyright law in Japan that went into effect on January 1st. But from what I was reading, this article comes from an anime news network. This law is meant to target people posting pirated manga images and that kind of thing. When clearly some of those things I just listed don't fall under that category. I was starting to read earlier today that uh, this information comes from uh, Greg, I forget his last name, on uh, Twitter. He's like a columnist who actually works for Shueisha. And also Arter from the Library of O'Hara. He's just a fan, but he does deep dives into these sorts of things. There appears to be some evidence that indicates that it's a third party falsely flagging these things. I'd have an opportunity to dig into the new information in detail. But it seems to be possible that it's not actually Shueisha directly flagging these things. And they haven't made any statements on it. So it's just kind of a wait and see sort of deal. But the point I'm getting at is for the next upcoming weeks that if you are a Twitter user, Facebook, YouTuber, whatever... Just be cautious about the kind of uh, images you're posting, because you might be flat and have your content removed. So exercise caution. And then the last thing is I wanted to give an update on the global popularity poll. Do you have any additional guesses about what the, the new front runners are, Jordan? I am going to guess that in most places, the monster trio are probably the monster trio of the poll as well. But who, who knows at this point? I know. I can tell you right now. Good. Let, let me in on it. <laughs> uh, indeed. In North America, at least, Luffy is number one, Zoro is number two, and Sanji is number three. Pop over to a couple others. In Japan, it is the same three, but in slightly different order. Zoro number one, Sanji number two, and Luffy number three. And then we'll just do one more, maybe. Let's do Europe. In Europe, the three are... Oh, slight shakeup in Europe. Zoro number one, Luffy number two, and Trafalgar Law is number three. Poor Sanji got booted out of his third place spot. Feels bad, but, you know, an acceptable replacement. I suppose. Now again, this voting period is going on through the 28th of February at midnight Japan time. And the website you can go to vote is onepiecewt100.com. Once again, OnePieceWT100.com. You can vote once per day. So if you're interested, go ahead and log in there. Anything else you would like to say in regards to the news before we begin your little segment here? No, like I said, I've been pretty off the internet as of late. It's all right. That brings us into our Variety Hour segment, in which we will again be discussing the events of chapters 1 through 15 of the One Piece mantra from a current reader's perspective. What would you like to talk about, Jordan? I'm going to be going through this chunk of 15 chapters kind of all together. Certainly not going to be going in-depth into a whole bunch of things. Some things that I noticed right away was, first of all, the world building right from the start is just incredible. From chapter one, so much of it is laid out already that is just the base of One Piece. Like, you get... Of course, the pirates, you get the devil fruit, you know the, the boons of it, you know the downsides of it. You get filled in on so much, but it's not overwhelming, and all of it is still true to this day, and that's just great to see. Well, that's true. I then take a very little from chapter one that's been retconned. Very little. Yeah. Moving on, something else. Personally, Axe Hand Morgan was so much more disturbing than I remembered him being. Like, his... <laughs> The actual axe arm, I don't understand why it had to extend so far past his elbow, and it just makes me feel uneasy. Well, it lets him use it with two hands, Jordan. He can hold that bottom bit that extends out from his elbow. They get a, a much harder swing. It's important. Yeah, it's all about power. With that man, yes. Yeah, well, actually, I believe that he said that it was about status and rank, which I guess in the, in the Navy is pretty equivalent to power. I was also rereading this alongside you today, and I was thinking Morgan's is the only example of a marine we've seen so far, like in canon, that behaves this way. For the most part, like the marine captains we've seen seem to be like actually 
believe in what they're doing, you know, and like not like a power hungry murderer who wants to kill a little girl because they snuck into his compound like this man is. Yeah, he's he's definitely on a different level than uh, pretty much everyone. Like Akainu, clearly not a good man, but he's not going to literally murder a child just for being there. Like if he believes that child is like an accomplice to a uh, well. I suppose in the instance of O'Hara, he was the one who decided to raise the entire island to the ground and not allow as many uh, seemingly innocent civilians back onto the rescue ships. But uh, aside from him, <laughs> uh, I don't think there's anyone who's behaved like this. I mean, they're the bad guys, so they're going to do evil things. But this is it's very aggressive. Very aggressive indeed. It's like enslaved this entire town. Not cool, Morgans. Not cool. Also, it set sort of a lot of the tone immediately. Uh, Luffy, when he actually meets Captain Morgan, Captain Morgan introduces himself and he's talking about how great he is. And Luffy simply responds with, nice to meet you. I'm Straw Hat Luffy. Like he is not even giving this dude the time of day. Again, it's nice to see that consistency throughout, honestly, the whole series. Indeed. Luffy has remained very consistent in terms of his attitude towards other people. From the start. It's, yeah, it's pretty great. Now, something that didn't stay consistent is the art style. (laughs) That has been a bit more shocking for me to sort of jump way back to the beginning for the first time. There's a panel on page 21 of chapter 12 where Luffy's like striking a pose or something and he's, he's got a fist sort of stretched towards the reader. And his his fist is just very, it's very round. It's very... Page 21 of chapter 12, you say? Yes. This is during the buggy arc, if I recall correctly. Correct. Let's take a peek here. Page 21. This bit where he's, like, sitting out front of the pet food store with his, like, fist kind of outstretched versus his chin. Is that what you're talking about? I assume so i don't have it up currently no i see but yeah i agree that looks a little bit jarring especially compared to it's more cartoony than it looks like these days well you you see what i mean about it being very round like his knuckles are they're they're little hills you know (laughs) that's true so it's just that that was that was kind of shocking to me and I, i love to see the development over x amount of time what else did I find interesting on my reread? Oh, I did. I had forgotten personally that Nami kind of put herself in the crew by accident first. <laughs> she referred to Luffy as her boss to get out of a situation with Buggy. She had no idea what she was getting into. <laughs> but Yeah, she put the idea in Luffy's head. He's like, yeah, I will be her boss. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's... I had forgotten that the first couple crewmates kind of had nothing to do with pirates. They wanted to be anything but pirates, frankly. Uh, but Luffy is just such a such a magnetic personality and such a force to be reckoned with that they they very quickly saw what they needed to do. And I think it's just, I mean, going back, it's good to see that the the loyalty has stayed. Never wavered the whole way through. The big payoff of having Nami finally say that Luffy's going to be the Pirate King. Like, to now go back and see her say that she wants nothing to do with pirates is... It's it's great character development. It's true. During the attack on Orangetown, specifically, the pet food shop, Luffy used a move called the, the Gomu Gomu Gavel against Richie the Lion. And I don't know if we've seen many of those, certainly not recently, where he grabs someone with arms that he has twisted to an extreme extent and sort of does almost a pile driver move with them into the ground. I would love to see an updated version of that move. I feel like we've seen a lot of a lot of moves evolve over time, but I'm not sure if we've seen that one. I don't think so. I know he uses a move called like the the hammer against Don Krieg. It's a little different because he uses his legs, but uh, now that you bring it up, I have no doubt in my mind that that would be the move to take down Kaido. 
Richie the Lion, <laughs> he's a beast. Kaido's a beast. There's a lot of parallels there that I don't think people consider. It's just math. <laughs> Something else that I noticed in regards to Richie and uh, his trainer, Moji. After getting beaten by Luffy, Mochi is then shown talking to Buggy, and he has Richie with him. So I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm thinking that Moji must have carried Richie back to the bar, which is no small feat. Mochi might look weird, but apparently he's at least got muscle. I don't remember the specific part, but yeah, if that's true, then Mochi's a beefy man. Why does he let his lion do all the work if he's got, like, giant lion lifting strength? Right? Like, Richie's not small. <laughs> I think we should maybe ditch this Luffy guy and start uh, standing Moji for Pirate King. I mean, he's got cuter ears, that's for sure. Indeed. <laughs> uh, other than that, Zoro's dream kind of started off a little, I don't know, a little lackluster, I guess. Like, there's just not much to it I think you're referring to how his like desire to be the greatest swordsman of all time sends from his promise with Kuina who then promptly died falling down a flight of stairs yes and I don't think that's really been expanded upon very much since then like in terms of the bat story like it's been like Span it upon in the present of how like he meets Mihawk a little bit later and that kind of like reinvigorates that desire and that kind of thing. But in terms of things that happened to Zoro in the past, I don't think it's really been addressed any further than this. Right. People have speculated like from the beginning that something more happened to Kuina beyond that. But like she was a child in like a random village. What more conspiracy could there be <laughs> beyond what we're being told you know there's no other damage there's nothing brought up mm -mm. like i had thought perhaps it was like a a rare sword collector after her uh her white sword the wadoichi monji but didn't take it so like why why kill a little girl for, you know if it ever happens i would think that wano would be the time to address it but it kind of feels like we're like too in the thick of Wano right now for it to be addressed at this point, you know? Right. We already would have heard some whisper of a connection or something. Now we do have a bit of a bit of a connection to that bat story and Wano, because we know that like some people in Zoro's village, I think even uh his master, may be descended from people in Wano. Um, because of the whole like Tsunachi thing, like the battle cry that Zoro told uh, Momonosuke about. But I feel as though that was going to be expanded upon if it would have been already. Yeah, I mean, didn't we also uh, very recently hear about how one of Zoro's swords was forged by the same person that forged uh, Odin's swords? Uh, yeah. Um, hmm. Yes, you're right, actually. Uh, Zoro's sword is the Sandai Kitetsu. And the one that we saw in Wano for the first time was the Nidai Kitetsu, both made by uh, the Tendu guy who's been palling around with them. For all we know, something will pop up with that. But for now, it's just, you know, we get those few pages in a flashback, and that's it for Zoro, which is kind of sad. Pretty much. He definitely seems to have one of the weaker uh, bat stories compared to the other crew members. Sanji was kind of in that boat, too. But then he got an entire arc to himself to kind of flesh that out beyond it. But Wano was kind of being built up to be the Zoro arc, and this kind of was not. So Zoro's done some cool things, but certainly nothing lore-wise, you're correct. Exactly. Now, it could still happen after the climax we're in right now, but kind of feels like that might be too late. I would be surprised to hear anything at this point. And that's, that's kind of what I took away from the first... 15 chapters personally did you have anything you wanted to note thomas there were two things i wanted to ask your opinion on both of which i believe happened in the first chapter debate has raged on pretty much since the inception of hockey about whether or not oda intended from the beginning uh shanks's power glare at 
the Lord of the Coast, that big fish he spooked in chapter one. Do you think that was always intended to be hockey, or do you think that was kind of retconned later on to be the case? Well, this is kind of cheating, but personally, I don't think it matters. I think that what it was was a showcase of Shanks's power. He is powerful enough that from a stare, whether it's, you know, Conqueror's hockey infused or whether it's just him, like he is powerful enough to scare off a sea king. And that statement was made. So personally, I don't think that it matters. You think that just the fact that he was spooky enough to spook this fish is enough of a showcase of his power and that the details of how he did it not terribly important? Well, the details... Sorry, maybe I said that incorrectly. The details do matter, but whether Oda always intended it or not, to me, does not matter. Oh, I see. Understood. I guess I agree. Now, if you want me to give an answer as to whether I think he always intended it or not, like if I was forced to, I would bet no, he was not intending that to be hockey he just wanted to show that shanks is not to be messed with and then he maybe decided to run with it because as far as i know he's never like come out and said anything about it so i agree i don't think he intended that to be hockey from the start i think that oda like many authors likes to leave stuff just vague enough to fill in the blanks with details later on and that people often mistake that for hardcore chapter one foreshadowing of things that won't be paid off for 500 chapters but uh yes in this case i think hockey was uh not conceived until much later on right i don't remember where i heard this or read it or whatever but someone was asking for writing advice and they got it from a professional and they said write the story once and then rewrite it again from the beginning now that you know what's happening or something along those lines and with something that is released on a weekly basis you don't get that luxury so you're you're right that writers would be smart to leave room to sort of adapt as they go exactly and now the other thing i wanted to ask is this is another debate that's been raged since chapter one is towards the end after he punches out pre-forementioned a big fish He's talking about how uh, he wants a, a crew of 10 men. People have discussed for many years now whether or not that's 10 total men, including Luffy himself, or Luffy plus 10 other guys. Where do you fall in this debate? 11 crew members or 10? Personally, I would like to see 10 plus Luffy because it's it's just more characters to love, and I trust Oda to... To create someone and put them in the crew in a, you know, in an organic way and not force it and have us love them. I think I agree, but currently we have 10, including Luffy and of course including Jimbe. So you don't think it's like kind of too late in the story now that we're kind of getting up to like the end to add an additional crew member to be fully attached to in the same way that we are all these other guys? Uh, depending on who it is, I mean, someone could join the crew that we already do know, uh, but also, like I said, I, I trust Oda to do it in a way that just makes sense. He hasn't done anything that, well, I'm sure he's done things that I have disagreed with, but, you know, adding, adding a character I've never had a problem with necessarily. Uh, so I trust him to to do that again if it comes to it. Do I think it's too late? No, <laughs> not not really. I I can get attached to to characters fairly easily, so I'm not worried about it. I've kind of had concerns about how Oda's been handling Jim Bay's joining of the crew in the last several years. Like this whole like song and dance of oh, will he join? Will he not? What happened to Jim Bay after Whole Cake Island? Is he really a crew member now? You know, um, but now that he's actually part of the crew, I feel as though looking back on it, it's been done in a fairly satisfying way. I just have concerns about whether or not adding someone fresh, like if 
for example, like the, the one of the front runners right now is Yamato, who we've only known for like 30 chapters, probably less. If they end up joining, they will have to like have a pretty dedicated like couple of arcs specifically for Yamato, just so that we know enough about them to like feel connected to them in the same way we are. I don't know, as an example, Usopp, you know. But like you said, Oda hasn't disappointed before. So, any other thoughts that you would like to leave us with before we wrap up this episode? I didn't know I was going to have final thoughts, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Well, in that case, we're going to head into head and wrap it up here. We will see you next week with chapter 1001 and anime episode 958. Goodbye. So long.